Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel, we have Dr. Suresh Karadkar, I believe. The video is entitled, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of the Carnivore Diet, What I've Learned as a Doctor. Now, I was actually sent this video by Ingrid Liptak. The video is a little lengthy compared to what would not make my video lengthy, meaning that it's 12 minutes long. But we're gonna try and get through it. I said that I would react to it, so here we are. So we're just gonna jump directly into it. But first, just like always, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week. And also buy my book, Contraindicated, if you have not already. And with that being said, now let's jump directly into the video. If you are thriving on the carnivore diet, fantastic. I'm very happy for you. But get your bloods done, Get your calcium. Why would you get your blood done? Blood tests don't really necessarily, at least, indicate or establish what someone's health status is at all. Levels don't matter. Presentation does. Scores done. Make sure. Calcium scores, sure, yeah. But that has lag time. That has inertia. So that can actually take quite a while to even show anything. But that also means that if you are on the carnivore diet and you have an increase steadily of your calcium score on a CAC test, that could be, and very well probably is, an inertial effect of your previous behaviors. It seems to be the case that for years you can have this lag time, this inertia. So that is also something to keep in mind. That you are actually thriving. What do you mean make sure that you're thriving though? People know that. People will know that based on how they feel and how they present. That's not inferred from blood tests. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Meek Medic Podcast. Now, recently I released an episode where I spoke about why I quit the carnivore diet. If you Oh boy. And to that, make sure you check it out. Link in the episode. To oh goodness, this video is actually 32 minutes long. There's no way we're getting through this. I said I'd follow up with a doctor review of the carnivore diet and well, here it is. For those who are new to the channel, hi. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Dr. Suresh Kawodka. I am a specialist GP and- Okay, so I just butchered the name, of course. Certified lifestyle physician here in Australia. And I was a practicing carnivore. I'm not now. Why? Well, you can check out the other video I made, uh, my personal story if you want to, but in this episode, I am gonna be talking about what I have learned from my patients who are following the carnivore diet over the last 12 to 18 months. This is my professional review. Okay, so I'm quite curious to see what this individual actually is in terms of his qualifications or quote unquote qualifications, because of course we know the integrity of experts nowadays. Board certified lifestyle physician, general practitioner. Okay, so here's what I have to say. I have no problem personally with anybody, even people without initials after their name, speaking about health and nutrition. In today's world, we actually have to do that. We have to stumble around until we find the right answers because unfortunately listening to experts has gotten us into the big biggest and largest silent genocide of our time in recent history, possibly in history. However, what I do want to say is to appeal to your own authority with respect to your advice to adopt dietary interventions or lifestyle interventions as an MD or a physician is not appropriate because MDs are not actively trained in that. A bit of background though first, if I may. I've been seeing patients now for about 12 to 18 months on the carnivore diet, and there's been a lot. In fact, I mean, every day I'm usually seeing at least one, one person a day who are on the carnivore diet, sometimes three or four. So whilst this isn't like a proper study, this is not a randomized control trial, case control, double blind, whatever you want to call it, I have got a fair bit of experience now over the last 12 to 18 months with it myself and, of course, with patients. And yes, unfortunately, I have seen some issues. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, and unfortunately ugly, and it can get real ugly. Well, this will be interesting. Follow the timestamps if you want to switch to the various sections if you want, but I would encourage you to listen to the whole thing to get a balanced view, and please do keep an open mind. Fair enough. Again, this is the my professional view of the last 12 to 18 months or so of seeing carnival patients. This is not my personal opinion, this is my professional opinion. Well, that's the same thing, really. You shouldn't say professional opinion, you should say experiential opinion. At the end of the day, it goes right back to what I just said about appealing to your own authority. That's irresponsible. I think if you're thriving on the carnival diet, look great, fantastic. Get your bloods done, make sure you're all fine. Covered that. Genuinely thriving, then amazing. But if you're not, maybe this video is for you. 
Let's start with the good. Well, if you're not thriving on the species-appropriate, species-specific diet, then you should talk to someone that's qualified and experienced to rearrange that diet so as to effectuate the thriving process and status, okay? You shouldn't just quit it. Covered this with Paul Saladino last week. So there's no doubt the carnivore diet has been amazing for myself and many of my patients. And that's why I got into it in the first place. Mm -hmm. I've spoken before about my very first carnivore patient who saw amazing improvements in his insulin resistance, weird nerve problems. Well, insulin resistance is a concept, but sure, fine. Let's roll with it. Went away, fatigue and tiredness went away, and yes, that's all true. This has been repeated numerous times over my patients. Amazing. Well, it's not surprising considering the fact that insulin resistance as a concept or idea is caused by effectively cross inhibition of fat and carbohydrates within cells. It has also been suggested that adipocytes only have a finite amount of or finite capacity to store triglycerides after synthesizing them. And if that is the case, that would explain why insulin resistance perniciously occurs rather than immediately, typically. But anyway. Improvements when changing to the carnivore diet initially. Fairly understandable, given it's a zero-carb diet. Remove the mm, sure, yeah. oils like canola oil and vegetable oil, which are terribly unhealthy and nobody should ever consume them. Correct. You just don't eat canola oil or vegetable oil. Uh, remove the fast food and just generally caring more about their health. And that is always going to be a good thing. So what kind of issues have I seen improve? Well, let's talk about skin first. Skin might not seem a very exciting thing to talk about, but for some people, their skin is just an absolute disaster and ruins their lives. Yes, the skin is the largest, largest organ of the body, and so it is also susceptible to inflammation. The manifestations of inflammation within skin are going to be different than other organs in other parts of the body, but of course it will manifest nevertheless. If you want an example of this, check out at Bradley Marshall Official to see his amazing skin transformation on the carnivore diet. He has given me permission to share his pics in this video. I've seen eczema, psoriasis, acne, rosacea, all improve very, very, very nicely on the carnivore diet. Yes. Arthritis. Now arthritis can be very disabling. I'm sure anybody with arthritis listening to this will tell you you ask anybody with arthritis they'll tell you it's very disabling and i have seen wonderful improvements in rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic arthritis osteoarthritis and just generally anything that we call seronegative quote unquote or basically what we call idiopathic arthritis idiopathic meaning they don't know the cause of it joint inflammation so inflammation once again so it makes sense the carnivore diet involves the abstention from and removal of plant toxins colloquially they are called and referred to as anti-nutrients that is just an anodyne sugar-coated term for well toxins or plant toxins that cause cause inflammation, lectins being one of them. Lectins being a compound, a plant protein within plants that utilizes molecular mimicry to basically differentiate itself effectively, at least ostensibly, into other proteins, domestic proteins of the body, which will cause the body to launch an immune response because it recognizes something that is foreign, has infiltrated the body, by opening the tight junctions of the gut lining, which is one cell thick, via zonulin. But in doing so, it will not only kill the lectin, it will also kill the domestic cell it is mimicking because they look very similar. It's a very real phenomenon. You get rid of things like oxalates, which tend to deposit in joints as well. Really oxalic acid is what we should be calling it. Then whenever they're consumed, they form salts within the body, ionic bonds between calcium particularly, usually, but also zinc. It can do so with zinc. And then they crystallize to form raphides. Those deposit in other places of the body if they're not excreted through the kidneys, which is one of the reasons, it is the reason why we have calcium oxalate kidney stones in the first place. Lots of things will be causing inflammation. In my opinion, lectins and oxalates are the biggest culprits though with respect to plants there are other plant toxins that do other things like phytates which well inhibit nutrient absorption in the stomach because of their electrochemical charges and stuff and how they function with respect to the ph of the solution that they're in such as the stomach acid for example which is very acidic so basically means we don't really know what causes it there you go but you go to the rheumatologist patients usually will end up on chemotherapy drugs like methotrexate anyway criminal the carnivore diet has helped a great many patients get off those terrible medications and given them vast improvements in their chronic pain. Well, there we go. You don't need to worry about the carnivore diet. There you go. You can leave this video now safely and go on with your lives. No, of course not. There's got to be some hidden danger. Speaking of chronic pain, 
I'm not sure there's many pain syndromes out there that are worse than fibromyalgia. I'm sure there's going to be people arguing about that. But it, I see this regularly. I don't have fibromyalgia, thankfully, but I have plenty of patients that do. And i got to say, it must be horrible just living... Another ostensibly inflammatory condition of nerves, so... ...in constant pain. The carnivore diet has helped many of those improve their pain. Not well, there you go. ...of completely, but at least improve, which for them is huge. Ellis Danlos syndrome. I'm getting quite a few patients. Hey, look at that. That's what I have. I'm a very, very severe case. It is a completely ameliorable condition, though. The treatments that I've been undergoing via regenerative therapy have been the things that have been helping me the most. What I will say, though, is once I transgress with one meal, such as, I don't know, for example, having some tomato sauce with my ground beef, my joint pain and nerve pain around my joints does flare up. When I embarked upon the carnivore diet, I didn't see any changes because I was still in so much pain because my condition was so severe still, so it was hard to see any improvement at all. Now that I've improved significantly, I can say that whenever I transgress from carnivore, my symptoms do flare up. So, there you go. The other thing that has vastly improved my symptoms whenever I'm having a symptom flare is actually the Cerule products that involve the Cyactive formula, such as Cyactive, right there, Cyactive joint, right there, Collagen active, right here, Oops, and hydroactive, actually. The last one seems to be the best because it has magnesium in it, which will relax your muscles. I think most of us in the space know how magnesium works in terms of its effects on muscles. If you desire to actually purchase those products, I would refer to the link on the bottom of the screen to get a permanent 10% discount and permanent free shipping on your orders when signing up for monthly deliveries. Or you can email me and you can find out how to receive those products for free, actually. But those are the most effective products at ameliorating my flare-ups when I do very seldomly now now have one. I was down the syndrome now and this connective tissue disorder is no joke. No it's not. It ruins lives and I've picked up many sometimes ends them patients with EDS. It is horrible but the carnivore diet does seem to help them at least a little bit. IBS and IBD so irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease I once again inflammation all this is going to tie back right back it's going to tie right back to inflammation all of it. In untold numbers of gut problems, not just these two, resolve on the carnival diet. Probably has to do with the absence of fiber, if I had to guess. IBS, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. There is no denying that as an elimination diet, the carnivore diet- Well, it's, that's an oversimplification. Yes, technically it is an elimination diet, sure, because you're eliminating contraindicated toxins and substances, sure, yes. But when you say elimination, there are some implications that it is therefore restrictive because you're restricting things that actually are totally benign and innocuous for most humans, and it's just a very small group of people that tend to have problems with it arbitrarily, and that's not the case. They are contraindicated for a reason. No one should be consuming them. It's a reverse reverting back to our species appropriate diet that we ate for well four and a half million years if you include protohumans that preceded our current speciation that being homo sapiens sapiens if you're going to refer just to our current speciation 350 to 400,000 years still is absolutely unbeatable imagine going to the toilet you know 12 to 15 times a day pooing blood almost constantly having constant pain in your abdomen and your guts and then suddenly everything resolves <laughs> within a month or so i mean how incredible is that Again, fiber. There's actually an anecdote in my book in chapter eight that has to do with that. Shout out to Josie Leader, who also had IBS as a vegan for over a decade and ameliorated that within, just like he said, a couple months, I believe. And that actually was without red meat at the time. She then later, of course, incorporated it back in. But anyway, I hope that I'm getting that right. If I'm not, she can correct me if she finds this video. Diabetes. Now I Yes, a disease characterized by chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. I know quite a bit about diabetes and I've talked about it extensively on this channel. Hence why I just became so reflexive right there. Because just had a video done on diabetes with respect to an Abby Sharp critique video. You know, Abby Sharp is a bowling ball. Yeah. I believe that low carb and keto diets are unbeatable. I st well, of course they are. Because they're diets that remove carbohydrates from them. The very thing that causes the disease. It's carbohydrate consumption is the pathology. Not insulin resistance.
Okay, not the Randall cycle itself. That's not a pathology. That's a mechanism. Those are mechanisms, okay? Which is why they are ideas and concepts and constructs. Okay, I'm not just parroting that term. That's why it's called that and referred to as such. The pathology is the consumption of carbohydrates, the very thing that is unnecessary for human survival in terms of exogenous introduction of it or of them, and the very thing that above a physiological concentration within the body is actively damaging via glycation, the covalent binding of glucose to things like albumin and hemoglobin. And not just glucose, by the way, fructose as well, the very thing that has a 7 to a 10 times more propensity or higher propensity to perform such a process. People do believe that when it comes to type 2 diabetes, type 1 um, and type 1, actually, you're about to talk about it. I really hope that you get this right. It's a little bit different, but then even then, ketogenic and low-carb diets can be very, very powerful. Yes, type 1 diabetics will still have to inject insulin. However, it will be far, far less insulin than they otherwise would have to inject if they were consuming carbohydrates every single day multiple times a day. So yeah, Dr. Ryan Attar is one of these people. Has an A1C of about, I think, 4.5%. Absolutely amazing. Seriously. And this is reflected in local guidelines here in Australia that thankfully now include low carb and ketogenic diets as a legitimate treatment for type 2 diabetes. And I recently heard about that. Unfortunately, the United States has not progressed to that point yet. I don't really see that happening anytime soon either, given the fact that the new member of the ADA head of whatever the f I don't care. She shouldn't be the head of f***ing anything health related, but she is, was hired to be the head of blank a few months ago. Find a nine inch plate, fill half the plate with non-starchy vegetables like leafy greens, green beans, broccoli, and then one quarter of the plate from lean protein and the remaining quarter section of your quality carbohydrate choice, such as starchy vegetables, rice, pasta, bread. So leave it to America. Carnivore is a ketogenic diet. Carnivore is not an exception to this, at least initially. It, it needs to be specified that the ketogenic diet, that being carnivore, is definitely different from a traditional keto diet that includes many plants and actually little protein. Most keto diet advocates that aren't carnivore diet advocates typically stress a very low protein consumption. It's basically protein phobia because they don't want to kick themselves out of ketosis, which just evinces their misunderstanding of human physiology because they need to understand and should understand that chronic, so to speak, ketosis, long-term ketosis, is damaging. It does lead to starvation eventually. The myth is that ketosis itself is a starvation situation. It's not. It's not at all. But it leads to it because it is a catabolic situation and eventually chronic catabolism turns into erosion and degradation. So that needs to be stated. We'll come back to that later, but I've had numerous patients with type 2 diabetes dramatically improve their HbA1c levels over very short time frames. Two to now, it also needs to be addressed here that the A1C level really should not be observed anymore. Why is that, Eddie? That's an extreme statement. Because first of all, the A1C level measures glycated hemoglobin over the span of about two months, maybe three months, basically two months though. But there are two things that can cause an elevated A1C. Number one is of course increased glycation of hemoglobin, but the other thing is the increased lifespan of hemoglobin, aka red blood cells themselves. Typically carnivores will see their A1C trend upward slowly over time because the red blood cells start living longer. There is good evidence of that. That's not just some desperate evasion of the actual phenomenon at hand. You can't have diabetes without consuming carbohydrates with respect to type 2 diabetes. So these people are not suffering from excessive glycation. That's not happening. Red blood cells are living longer. So context matters right there. But there are so many things that can affect the A1C. For example, you can actually present with a lower A1C if your red blood cells are living for far less time for the same reason. So if you're eating a bunch of seed oils that typically have these, these things called plant sterols. So you've got cholesterol, but then you've got plant sterols, which are very structurally similar to cholesterol and can actually be incorporated into cell membranes of things like red blood cells, you will damage those red blood cells and cause them to live for far less time. So your A1C can actually trend lower by consuming seed oils, perhaps. There's just so many different things that can affect it. What we should be looking at is, yes, fasting glucose and also fasting insulin. Those two things seem to be good indicators. Those are the only things that you need to look at and observe and assess is really what I should say. So yes, you're going to see improvements, so to speak, which is a value judgment statement that typically means trending downward. But once again, context matters, so maybe it's not an improvement. What we should be looking at is not the A1C at all. Once, sometimes. And most of those were not newly diagnosed diabetes, because they tend, they can rebound pretty quickly. These were long-standing, some of them even on insulin, and they've now managed to either significantly reduce that or stop that completely, which is in line with that uh, 2022, I think it was, Harvard study, uh, just over 2,000 patients on the carnivore diet. Weight loss, uh, this That's also featured in my book. Please go ahead and buy that. Chapter 8, once again, at the very end. Double-edged sword. 
Yes, weight loss. Sorry, I'm getting a little distracted. I keep looking over at the camera. Weight loss, of course, because obesity or an overweight status is a hormonal dysregulation problem with respect to insulin and things like estrogen and all that. It's primarily insulin. So, of course, that makes sense. What raises insulin? Well, you've got protein, but that's typically demand-driven, and it doesn't cause a spike in insulin. It's pretty much a sort of think of it as a speed bump or something. It's a slight undulating curve. The thing that causes a spike in insulin and therefore a vast increase in the anabolic status of the body is the consumption of carbohydrates because carbohydrates break down to glucose, glucose will leave the small intestine and enter the blood, and, well, the very thing that is involved in ushering glucose into cells or administering it into cells is insulin. So you get a vast commensurate increase, well, sort of commensurate increase, in insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas. What do I mean by sort of commensurate? It actually releases too much, which can cause and does cause a hypoglycemic status afterwards, which causes hunger and fatigue and lightheadedness, which elicits someone to eat eat even more carbohydrates, and then you get the spike in trough phenomenon. That's what causes it, or at least one of the things that causes it. The other thing, though, is the fact that most people on a carbohydrate-dominant diet cannot fast for long periods of time because the enzymes involved in beta-oxidation, the oxidation of fatty acids for fuel, are lowered because why would your body create enzymes and encode for the production of certain enzymes that it doesn't require? It's efficiency. And also, same thing for gluconeogenesis, the derivation of glucose from non-glucose precursors. Those are downregulated as well. So that will also also cause people to eat more and more just multiple times a day so anyway about but generally i've seen patients having pretty profound weight loss following the carnivore diet not a shock if you know anything about physiology it makes complete sense as to why this is occurring for a while some of the initial weight loss will be water weight of course there's no doubt if you go on any diet you're going to lose water weight first because the metabolic byproducts of carbohydrates are water and carbon dioxide and the metabolic byproducts of fat are the exact same so if you cut one of the macronutrients out well you're not going to be producing as much water but also even if you were just consuming less food you will not be producing as much water so any diet you go on you will lose water weight fat takes longer time to lose it seems to be because of the recycling that the body does with glycerol and fatty acids. Um, I just read a paper on this last week. Glyceroneogenesis and stuff. But only a couple of kilos. Some have come back in and they've lost maybe 10 kilos in two weeks. Some have lost 20 to 30 kilos over a few months. But some, unfortunately haven't shifted at all. Yes, that can happen. Patience is a big thing. You need patience because yes, the body recycles a lot of nutrients, but also the other thing that you need to consider is how much muscle you have on your body. Muscle increases basal metabolic rate, and so you can expedite the stagnation period, or you can just completely push through that, is what I should be saying. So increase muscle mass on your body. How often are you eating carnivorous foods? Are you having any sweeteners? There's a many, many, many factors that need to be considered here. How many polyunsaturated fatty acids are you consuming as well? How inflamed are you? Do you have any inflammation? inflammatory conditions. All of these matter. Either on the scales or the tape measure. And I'm regularly seeing this on the forums, people complaining that they're not losing weight. Other yes, that can happen. And I've seen that as well. But once again, patience is a big thing that you need to have. And then all of the other things need to be considered. Once again, if you're having problems, you need to discuss this with someone that really knows what they're talking about. Okay. And I can refer you to some people. They maybe lose a lot of weight and then it just seems to stall. Asthma. Now, I've got a few asthmatic patients. I don't have that many, actually, interestingly, but the ones that do have asthma on the... I'm going to be honest, I know nothing about the etiology or at least the suggested etiology or the theorized etiologies of asthma at all. So I can't speak upon this. ...diet have pretty much universally told me they've managed to reduce and usually stop their preventative inhalers, usually in inhaled corticosteroids when they're following a carnivore oh well if they're corticosteroids then it's anti-inflammatory anyway which is absolutely incredible long-term steroid use is associated with lots of health problems including things like osteoporosis and of course type 2 diabetes so any reduction in an inhaled corticosteroid whilst of course maintaining adequate control of their asthma is absolutely incredible mental health this is a big one there's no doubt. I have seen people... Mental health is also, once again, as I've talked about in my book, in chapter four, I believe, highly associated with brain inflammation. Having dramatic improvements in their mental health on the carnivore diet, with conditions ranging from things like ADHD all the way over to schizophrenia. Most of what I see is anxiety and depression, and there's been tremendous benefits, there's no doubt, with patients with anxiety and depression, and many patients reporting this kind of stress shield almost that I've spoken about before that I found. They found that depression and anxiety has kind of just disappeared. It's just gone.
usually very quickly, and many have reduced or stopped their antidepressant medications. I've also... The very medications that scientists are unaware of the mechanisms behind. They don't know how they work at all. So they prescribe them and no one knows how the hell they work. So just another important note. Talk about that in my book as well. I patients with two patients with bipolar and schizophrenia managed to reduce some of their medications, which has been huge for them. Okay, so so far I've seen no reason to halt the carnivore diet. None. But did it all last? Good timing. Well, that brings me to the bad. The other stuff. Let's get into it. There is sometimes. <laughs> now I know that's that's really annoying and not very helpful. So let me. Also, with respect to what conditions? Are you talking about a temporary amelioration in diabetes? Highly doubt that. Explain. I was very zealous early on when I found the carnivore diet. That's really the reason I made this podcast because I wanted to share what I had learned. This amazing thing. But I fell into this trap of, oh, don't, don't worry, you don't really need blood tests. Don't really worry about... Because you really don't. If you are having problems, blood tests can be a good indicator as to what is occurring. But it all goes back to, you are having problems, so therefore you are presenting with a problem. Don't just get blood tests if you're thriving. That's really what I mean. Things. All you really need to do is do the carnivore diet and everything will get better, which honestly I'm a little bit unhappy about now. Well, yeah, that's there are proper ways to do the diet. There are improper ways to do the diet. There are things that are carnivore but aren't particularly indicated for human physiology. Way too vague of a statement. I do feel like I've maybe failed some of my patients, which is a lot for me to admit. But thankfully, most of my early patients actually did come back because they did want some tracking or they've listened to the podcast and they realized they might be having some issues or they were generally having some issues. And so they came back. So I kind of had the chance to make up for it a little bit there. Despite my initial zealotry, I did notice fairly early on that whilst people were doing amazingly on the carnivore diet, mm -hmm. many of them weren't actually doing the carnivore diet anymore. Okay, so how does this have anything to do with the carnivore diet being bad? Actually, were calling themselves carnivore, but when I actually asked them, what are you actually eating? They'd added in some sugar. Well, there's the first problem. They'd added in some fruit, maybe. They'd added in some vegetables, maybe salads even. Okay. They were basically keto. They weren't carnivore. Not That's a problem. It's carnivore. Most of them stayed amazing, though. Most of those issues they had had stayed away. Fantastic. If they want to do that and they have a steady remission of their symptoms and their illnesses, then do that. Well, what gives? I mean, if carnival was the cure, how could they stay healthy if they went off carnival? Well, that has to do with an amelioration of their metabolism, most likely, and their conditions. Okay. A good analogy is if you have a cut on your arm and there's tiny abrasions that you continue abrading it with, then it will not heal. But if you let it completely heal, those tiny abrasions won't do anything to you anymore. It won't cause a cut anymore. That you, your, your body's totally fine with withstanding them. But you must remember what caused the abrasion in the first place. Okay. And, and, and really, if you want to know why people do this, it's because people are addicted to things. Okay, sugar is addicting. That is what it comes down to. I'm not going to pretend like I'm exempt from this. I'm, I'm not saying this sanctimoniously. We have tomato sauce in the fridge. I put like a spoonful or two of it in my beef once in a while. Should I be doing that? No, I shouldn't be f doing that. But you know what? The sooner we can start admitting that we're addicted to some degree to some things, the better off we'll be. It's pretty liberating actually admitting it. Well, actually some didn't. They actually got worse when they added some things back in. Okay, so how is this proving that the carnivore diet has a bad side? This is your bad section. And what the issue there was it wasn't sugar. It was actually oxalates. Okay. And I spoke about this in my 12-month video. I spoke about this a little bit in my video interview with Sally Norton as well. Make sure you guys check those out. Oxalates were the issue. And adding okay. in the oxalates was problematic for them. But keeping them out, things were fine. Sugar didn't actually cause much of an issue when they added back in. So what Okay, that depends on the person though. Typically when people add in just a little bit of sugar again, in terms of physiologically, it's not going to harm them too much, but mentally it can shoot them right back into a binge. The reduction in sugar that was also giving these amazing autoimmune benefits like arthritis, thyroids. Not actually, no, 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 that's speculation. It may very well have been. It could have been a multifaceted issue, actually. Sugar may not have been the most salient factor, but sugar absolutely above a physiological level does cause inflammation, which will worsen those conditions. In all of that kind of stuff. 
So was it Carnivore that was actually doing all of that amazing work? Well, probably, yes. Or was it the Oxalates? Was well, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Oxalates are not indicated. Sugar isn't indicated with respect to the consumption of it. I always have to add that because for some reason people believe that when we say carbohydrates aren't necessary, they believe that we mean any at all, like the body doesn't depend on carbohydrates when it absolutely does when you're speaking upon the brain, the muscles that actually can't twitch without glucose, the nerves. It's just ridiculous. Zero oxalate. Was it the zero plant toxin side of carnivore? Now you can argue, well, that's carnivore. Yes, but also you can do carnivore without, or you can do, sorry, zero oxalate without doing carnivore. Sure. Doesn't mean it's indicated. But what was doing all the heavy lifting here? Was it carnivore or was it the zero oxalate diet? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Let me put this into perspective for you. Someone that presents with massive amounts of inflammation, removing everything inflammatory is going to have a complete remission of inflammation, let's say. Ideally, and, and let's just say that happened with many of these people. It seems. I mean, they don't have any symptoms anymore, whatever. Then they add in something that may not have been the most salient cause, or at least exacerbator, of their inflammation. Well, they're completely fixed from all of their inflammation, the massive amounts of inflammation. So if you add in something that's just more insignificantly inflammatory, as compared to oxalates, well, they can still have a complete remission of their symptoms. It goes right back to the abrasion analogy I just used. It doesn't mean they should be consuming the sugar. It means that you can get your body to a point where you can start consuming it again. Sure. Should you be doing that? No. It really is this simple. I suspect it's the zero oxalate diet, actually. So what? You may very well be correct. You deal with patients all the time. I don't. But it doesn't matter. My experience over the last 12 to 18 months would suggest it was actually removing the oxalates that was really giving all of these amazing benefits of things like the skin issues, the arthritis, the joint problems, the autoimmune issues. The right, and that could make it to where sugar, sugar could have been their exacerbator or one of them, but removing the actual underpinning most salient cause could make it to where the sugar consumption when they introduced it back in wasn't causing them symptom flares and massive amounts of inflammation. It doesn't mean they should still be consuming the sugar. And it doesn't mean that people shouldn't go carnivore. By the way, even after saying all that, I'm still trying to figure out why this makes carnivore bad. How is this the bad side of carnivore? Issues, all of that was actually really the oxalates, not the carnivore. That's speculation. You can't say that with such conviction. It itself. But I only learned that with time and with experience. Almost everybody came back that maybe one to two months saying, they felt great, but they just didn't want to do carnivore anymore. Right. They wanted to perpetuate their addiction to sugar. Unless they were under the impression that carnivore necessarily means 100% carnivore, which that's not true. If you're 95% carnivore, meaning animal products, and the other 5% you have some berries on the side or something, you're still carnivore. They wanted to eat something else, anything else. I've spoke about this a little bit before. With respect to sugar, it's them wanting to perpetuate their addiction. Sorry. Not many people are addicted to broccoli and cauliflower. So if they wanted to just switch things up because of palate fatigue, then I wouldn't call that addiction. But I want to give you an analogy. Because you might think, well, steak's amazing. How can you not want to eat steak 24-7? But imagine a chocolate cake that is the most amazing cake in the world. And you can eat it completely guilt-free. Wouldn't that be nice? It won't make you fat, won't give you diabetes, and will actually improve your health, this magical chocolate cake. I mean, amazing. That sounds amazing. Give that to me right now. I'm sure there's people out there thinking, my God, I want this cake. <laughs> Where does it exist? It doesn't. It's magical. But what if you had to eat this cake every single meal, every single day for the... Okay, well, that's the misconception here. Okay, on carnivore, you don't have to do that. You don't have to eat a steak every single day. People may think that carnivore has no variety. It has so much variety. So much. You'd also be surprised at how much you can ameliorate your palate fatigue with the slightest changes in the way that you're making your food, even. For example, a lot of people have bowls of ground beef and it gets old. Make that ground beef into burger patties. You'd be surprised. It's the same food, but it's just different for many people. So... It's also another note to add. ...of your life with never eating anything else. Suddenly that magical cake doesn't quite sound so appealing. And this is what people were saying to me. Some people were so desperate to eat something else that wasn't meat, that when I basically told them, look, it's okay to eat something else, they cried, literally cried. 
Okay, but they're operating under a false notion that you have to eat one food in the same way every single day for the rest of your life on carnivore. You know you don't. Many different types of seafood exist. Many different types of steak, first of all. Many different ways to make a steak. Same thing with ground beef. Many different ways to make ground beef. You've got different types of dairy products that you can incorporate, even just as a, as a treat to, to ameliorate palate fatigue, even though dairy isn't the most indicated thing, but it is still carnivore. You've got many, many, many different things. And also spices are technically not carnivore carnivore because they're from plants, but you can still use those if they don't bother you. That's still carnivore. Just saying. Tears of joy. I've honestly lost count of the number of people I've spoken to who have either been patients or they've messaged me, email, whatever, who are following the carnivore diet, who are just desperate to eat something else. They feel like they've just been scared. This doesn't make carnivore bad, by the way, because this is a complete misconception that somehow it's overly restrictive and strict. What I also want to say, though, this may sound harsh, and I'm not trying to denigrate or disparage the people that he is using as an example here. But what I want to say is the way we think about food today is a problem. We think about food as a source of enjoyment, like exercising is, for some people at least, and like hanging out with friends is. We eat to live. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't enjoy the food you eat or else well, you're not going to want to eat it in the first place. However, you shouldn't go to food for enjoyment. So that could be a source of so many people's desire for variety is because they're still looking forward to food as a sort of source of enjoyment. That could be an issue. Head into just sticking on this rigid diet and they are upset. They are unhappy. They don't like what they're eating. And then I contacted them back and just said, look, it's okay. Just eat something else. It's fine. And then they usually email me back saying, they're, they're just, they're, again, tears of joy. They're just, they're so happy that they could eat something else. That does Also, many of these people just need to eat one meal and then they can go right back to eating the other thing that they were eating that became so insipid. So it doesn't mean they have to just stop doing carnivore, but. Really sound very good to me. That doesn't sit great with me that if you're so unhappy with the food that you're eating that you are literally in tears. Well, hold on a minute. They're not exactly unhappy with the food they're eating. They're unhappy with this false notion that they have to eat the same food for the rest of their life. Not true. So we already covered that. That is not a bad aspect of carnivore then. That is a big problem. That is an eating disorder. So did everyone with all those- But we already covered that. It's, it, it, it's an eating disorder because of their false notions. We already covered that. As I listed earlier, improve. Well, no, actually, they didn't. The vast majority did, don't get me wrong, but not everybody. For example, some people's mental health didn't improve. Right, and mental health is not exclusive to dietary dysfunction or something, or dysregulation. Mental health can be an actual mental issue. Okay, so once again, that's not a bad part of carnivore. Carnivore isn't a panacea. It's not a catholicon. It's not a cure-all, okay? There are etiologies, there are roots to diseases, especially with respect to mental health. The brain is such a complicated system, first and foremost, but also the way in which people think and people's past and other traumas that they may have will impact the way they think and impact their mental health. So once again, not a bad aspect of carnivore, because you can't say that since carnivore didn't cure everything on the face of the planet, that therefore that's a bad aspect of it. No. It isn't a failing of the carnivore diet as such. It there we go. Didn't work. Now, I don't think many doctors out there are specifically saying that carnivore will magically fix everything. No. Okay. I'm glad that you're not saying that. I think that's the implication that some people are making. It definitely is. And it's certainly perpetuated by the kind of general population of the carnivore diet, basically, on either all these forums, Facebook groups, and so on. Some people, their gut issues just never resolved. And in fact, some actually got worse. A chronic yes, but did they change their diet overnight? Because that is the biggest culprit. Your gut microbiome needs to adjust to the diet that you're transitioning to. It needs to do so or else you can have problems for months and it can take months to develop those problems. Massive problems. Bad. Yeah sometimes years six to eight week transition period each week upping your intake of animal products while commensurately decreasing your consumption of plants and carbohydrates that will also help to stave off and hedge against rather the keto flu that is what the cause of that is it, it's an overnight transition to carnivore some seems to be a particular problem that some people face i mean i regularly see people posting on forums again saying they've had diarrhea for two years 
and everybody just saying, you know, quote unquote, trust the system, it will work. Well, also, by the way, the other problem that can cause that is too much fat compared to the amount of protein one is consuming. Too high of a fat to protein ratio. That can also cause it. Now, it's very difficult to overeat on fat unless you're consuming sweeteners or pairing it with some kind of carbohydrate, even in a minor amount. Or, by the way, eating far too much cheese because dairy is addictive. Okay, beta casomorphin, morphine. I mean, sorry, you've had diarrhea for two years. That's that's a problem. Yes. Okay. And there's many things that can cause that problem. Chronic constipation and no amount of changing fat ratios, increase, decrease, electrolytes, anything just seems to fix it. Nothing seems to fix it for them. Right, and we already covered one of the reasons why that may be the case. They transition overnight. Also, I'd like to see some absolute values with respect to how many people are having this problem that didn't have an amelioration of it with all of those interventions as compared to the entire carnivore population at large to gauge how many people are really dealing with the issue. And then I'd like to ask those people how they transitioned to carnivore and if they're eating dairy. And as I said, I regularly see people on Facebook groups and so on, Reddit, etc., saying, I'll just trust the system or quote unquote, you aren't doing it hard enough. Or, right. And those are probably the zealots in the space talking, the religious zealots, because every single group has them. And I don't have respect for any zealots like that, especially the vitriolic ones and the acrid ones within any space. To be more carnivore for people that are having these issues. And I hate to say it, but honestly, it's just like vegan support groups. Yes. You know, whenever someone isn't getting on with it, it's their fault, not the diet. Correct. Yes. It is a serious issue that people need to stop doing, at least in the vitriolic way, right? The difference, however, is that in the carnivore space, nobody really has problems. And it seems to be that if they are, there is something that they are doing wrong. It doesn't mean to blame them and, and vituperate them, to viciously chastise them and castigate them. That's not what it means. What it means is to just inquire and suggest options and suggest potential culprits for the issues. See, the difference is that the vegan diet, people will always have problems on eventually because it is not an appropriate diet for human beings and if people transgress from veganism they're a bad person because killing an animal is a blight on the planet or something so which probably isn't true electrolyte imbalances cramps and just feeling exhausted and tired also seem to be a particular issue on the carnivore diet that again okay, that is not the fault of the carnivore diet that seems to be the absence of a sufficient bolus of protein to effectuate an adequate insulin response to maintain electrolytes at the level of the kidney these people will also typically present with hormonal imbalances thyroid problems so temperature dysregulation as well being cold all the time okay it's long-term ketosis that's the problem they're either eating too little protein within a day for their physiological needs or they they are not eating sufficient protein in one bolus. They're splitting their meals. Okay, there you go. Paul Saladino had this problem. Of course, his solution was to just dump 300 plus grams of carbohydrates down his throat. But anyway, some of us are more intelligent. None of these influencers are talking about. Uh... That's nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. When was this video recorded? Three months ago. I mean, many people have been talking about this. It's, some, it's very trite. And I don't really know why. Daily, I see probably again like 10 to 20 posts across my various social media platforms about people struggling on the carnivore diet with big issues like, yeah, fatigue, tiredness, deranged liver functions, severe muscle... Deranged liver functions? I'd like to see some evidence for that. People are healing their liver functions on carnivore. This is an extremely multifaceted issue. Are they already metabolically deranged? But once again, what, what, does, what does liver derangement entail? What, is, what, what does that mean? severe diarrhea as i've said terrible headaches weight gain uh not even just not weight loss but weight gain and just feel yes that can happen you have to get to the root issue what you're doing is you're labeling these issues as the faults of the carnivore diet the problems of the carnivore diet it's nonsense sir nonsense terrible and honestly, the answer is always the same or just trust the system or, you know. Okay, a lot of times patience is something that you need to have. Someone I know personally was overweight and it took months for them to start losing and they've lost 30 plus pounds on this diet. Patience is sometimes what people need. However, it is not everything, especially if they're continuing to gain weight. Okay, you have to get to the root issue. Some supplements or, or take electrolytes. Now I've said electrolytes are really probably not going to help with weight gain. I'll say it again. If you have to supplement with anything, your diet is incomplete and it's not a natural human diet. 
correct. However, with respect to electrolytes, that is not a typical supplement. You have to think, the natural human diet, the proper human diet, as Ken Berry calls it, or the species appropriate species specific diet, that being 100% carnivore, was consumed by our ancestors for millions of years, but the way in which they consumed that animal was different. For example, we drank the blood, typically, and if we didn't drink the blood, the meat that we ate had blood on it, which is where most electrolytes are. Well, now we drain the blood. So you could say that actually the carnivore diet today is not a natural human diet, or as natural as it could be, because we are not taking it out of the animal and consuming it raw with the blood on top of it. Which, by the way, though, we've been using fire for about 900,000 to 1 million years cooking our meat with it. So even then, it's not exactly the case that in order to be natural in terms of its diet, in terms of the diet, you have to consume it raw. But anyway, it needs to be said. But also, we did seek out salt for electrolytes. So anyway, we're 16 minutes and 36 seconds through this video out of 32 minutes. So we've actually made it a little over halfway. We're going to go a little bit longer, but so far I'm not impressed with this. We haven't even gotten to the ugly. We might not even get to it. I can link the original video down in the description below so that you can comment on it if you want, comment your thoughts on it, or watch the rest of it, or both. But this isn't convincing me. Not everyone, I didn't, but some carnivores are spending hundreds of dollars a month on supplements, like electrolyte supplements. Unnecessary. Just to live a normal life. Absolutely unnecessary. Also, hundreds of dollars on electrolyte supplements? Really? Which is, frankly, ridiculous. At some point, you have to wake up and say, hey, you know what? I don't think this is working for me. The way in which you are doing it. I'm sorry, I know that that may sound like vegan zealotry, or at least a, a carnivore parallel, but it isn't, because we're not blaming the person, per se, okay? We're not calling them a bad person. We're just saying, hey, have you tried all of the options available to you? Because if you did, you'd probably see a benefit. Nutritional deficiencies are unfortunately very common on carnivore diet. Nonsense. This is nonsense. As inferred by what? As much as people like Professor Barquet, who I respect, say, you know, we don't use much vitamin C on a carnivore diet, that... You don't. ...be true. Correct. Not the same as saying we don't need any. And I've seen... Well, who said that you don't need any? ...numerous carnivores with visible, observable signs of nutritional deficiencies, including things like vitamin C. Inferred by what? If you start to talk about scurvy, we're going to have a serious problem. Show me case studies, any case study, of someone adopting a carnivore diet, a properly tenured and properly fortified one, not someone eating canned beef that has been stored for God knows how long. Vitamin C is degraded after months of storage, by the way, okay? That has developed scurvy. I'm yet to meet a single carnivore patient, myself included, that does not have a folate deficiency. Deficiency means that you do not have adequate and sufficient folate in this respect, in this regard, for your physiological needs. Did they present with a folate deficiency or was that inferred from a blood test? Those blood tests being compared with the levels of normal people within the population. They're normative levels. They're based upon normative levels of the population. The population at large being deranged is what we should say, okay? Levels don't matter, presentation does. For example, Sean Baker has presented on multiple occasions with testosterone levels, both free and total, that are low. I believe total didn't even peak 200. Multiple times. Now look at that man and tell me if he has a testosterone deficiency. He doesn't. The levels will change on a panel with respect to dietary intervention. That's normal. It's in the reference range usually, but we all know reference ranges are basically garbage. Right. Okay. So what, though? Do they present with a folate deficiency? Still low. And we know it's low. And we know it's affecting them. How is it affecting them? homocysteine is almost always high. Okay. Can contribute to cardiovascular disease if elevated. Show me some evidence for that. Can is a word that is used to describe something able to occur as inferred from studies that have shown that it has at least once been shown to cause said presentation. There are no studies to inform upon that whatsoever or to prove that. Health risks. No, not risks. Show me some evidence that they actually had a folate deficiency. Were they deficient in that vitamin? That will be inferred by their presentation. Any responsible clinician knows this. Supplement folate, folate goes up, homocysteine comes down. So? You know the folate was a problem. Homos no, it wasn't a problem. Basically, long and short of it tells you if your body's happy or not. If you're That's ridiculous. That is the epitome of reductionism. The absolute epitome of reductionism. Nonsense, sir. Homocysteine's fine. Your body Define fine. 
will be reasonably happy. Zinc it's just nonsense. That, that's just theology there. Efficiency, weirdly, also seems to be a problem. As inferred by what? Another blood test? Did they present with symptoms of zinc deficiency? I say weirdly because it shouldn't be. <laughs> right, so it may tell you the fact that they're probably not deficient in zinc. Truly deficient. Mainly comes from meat and seafood, of course, as well. And no okay, so then what's the issue here, sir? So they're consuming sufficient zinc, so why would they have a deficiency in zinc? Plant toxins, sorry, to bind them up like oxalates and phytates. We're not eating those on a carnivore diet, but it still almost always seems to be low. Low with respect to the normative level of the population, the normative level of the population being representative of a deranged population. Okay. Maybe it's got something to do with, with the almost complete lack of boron in the diet. I don't know. Boron, again, is a problem that I've talked, spoken about before. Show me some evidence of people being boron, zinc, and folate deficient. Show me some evidence of presentation of these people that would indicate that they are deficient in these vitamins and minerals. My 30-day ribeye challenge. If all that wasn't bad enough, Let's talk about the ugly. Let's talk about it, because all that wasn't bad enough at all. We already covered everything, didn't we? Now, I'm sorry to say it, but I've seen some pretty bad issues on the carnivore diet. So what? That's an association. You have to understand that people are transitioning to a totally different diet. So even if it is the species-appropriate, species-specific diet for human beings, if they haven't been consuming it for their entire lives, you cannot expect everything to be copacetic. So much that I have stopped recommending it now. Well, that's that's a problem. In my opinion, that is a problem. You can do what you want, but that is a problem. A long-term diet and only... Well, that's that's a problem. As a short-term elimination diet, which is... It's nonsense. That's a problem. It's amazing for, but just not long-term. Well, that's an opinion, and it's not rooted in anything except theology. Let's start with diabetes. Now, I'm talking about type 2 diabetes here. Really? Seriously? Okay, let's talk about it. I mentioned earlier... I've seen some amazing successes with reducing HbA1c. Covered that. Uh, improving insulin levels and deprescribing diabetes medications. As okay, we're, I'm going to assume that imp improving insulin levels means lowering them to a more acceptable homeostatic set point. Okay. You know, mirrors that carnivore study from Harvard, including, of course, insulin injections, which is amazing. Getting off insulin is so fantastic. But it doesn't seem to last. In what are you talking about, sir? What in the absolute f*** are you talking about? Diabetes type 2 is a disease characterized by chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. All diabetes is actually, but type 2 diabetes is caused by carbohydrate consumption to some degree. Necessarily. Somewhere between 3 to 9 months, their bloods start getting worse. What do you mean, bloods start getting worse? Insulin, fasting insulin starts to creep up. That could be an indication that they are consuming too much protein. Could be. A1C creeps up. Cover the A1C phenomenon. That does tend to happen. That does not mean that their blood glucose levels are increasing because of protein intake or something. It could also mean that, though, and that could be something to talk to them about. But HbA1c should be expected to start to creep up eventually. And that is because of an increase in the lifespan of red blood cells. We know this. Fasting glucose creeps up. No. Okay, that could be an indication that someone is consuming more protein than they require. I would suspect that that is primarily the case in muscular men, because they tend to overconsume protein, and underconsume fat, actually, as well. Again, you are looking at blood markers and not presentation, okay? The carnivores are going to say, yes, but HbA1c goes up on the carnivore diet, because... It does. ...blood cells live longer. They're... Well, that's not only why it could go up. Cover that as well. Or there's more glucose for them to glycate because they're living longer. So HbA1c will go up. They have longer time to accrue glycation damage from endogenously created glucose. Yes, correct. That may be true. It is true. But I'm yet to see any credible evidence to actually support that statement. There's a number of studies in rats which demonstrate this might be a thing. Okay, and rats have similar blood chemistry to us, so they could be an appropriate, extrapolatable study reference, but... Uh, there's a couple of studies in humans, which are going to... I'll put links in the episode description, showing that it may increase red blood cell lifespan, but at most it's a few days. Hardly explanation, really, as to why HbA1c goes up so much on a carnivore diet. Well, once again, there are multiple reasons why it could go up and could increase. 
even if it were true that red blood cells lifespan increases and look that's probably a good thing if it does it wouldn't explain why fasting insulin and fasting glucose also go up as well. Okay, but I just covered that, didn't I? Did you talk to them about their protein consumption? And did you also talk to them about their fat consumption as well? Because the ratios matter here. I talked about insulin suppression, another concept and construct, and another idea in my book, Contraindicated. Once again, another plug for it. There is a lot of valuable information in there, okay? The concept of insulin suppression does show that the ratios of fat to protein have a significant impact, or at least can have a significant impact, on one's physiology, which will be borne out in blood tests and represent in blood tests. Sure. The likelihood is that this is a physiological insulin response or physiological insulin resistance, I should say. Other physiological insulin resistance I've covered time and time again on this channel. Physiological insulin resistance is another concept. It is different than what is colloquially deemed pathological insulin resistance, which is, to put it very simply, a Randall cycle upregulation, at least the status of it in their body. Peripheral insulin resistance is the other name for physiological insulin resistance. It just doesn't matter what you call it. It's the same phenomenon. Is a process by which two things occur. When the abstention of carbohydrates is embarked upon in someone, the transporters on the exteriors of cell membranes, particularly muscle cells and fat cells, adipocytes, that being the GLUT4 transporter, the transporter responsible for allowing for the administration of glucose into them by insulin, are downregulated in terms of their production. The body will not produce as many of them because you are not consuming as much glucose. That will prevent the body from metabolizing that glucose via oxidation as effectively and as adeptly and proficiently as it could if you were consuming carbohydrates every single day. So that's the first thing. The second thing actually still has to do with the Randall cycle, and it's the fact that the Randall cycle shows us patently and demonstrates demonstrates patently that the body, with respect to the cells of the body, will tend to be oxidizing the fuel that it has been oxidizing until something perturbs that equilibrium balance significantly. What do I mean by that? If someone that is consuming fat predominantly, and therefore is oxidizing fat predominantly and primarily, consumes a bolus of carbohydrates, that will also be another reason as to why the cells will not be able to metabolize that glucose via oxidation as proficiently and as adeptly as someone else that is consuming carbohydrates as their predominant fuel source. Those two things will cause someone to have elevated insulin and elevated blood glucose more so as compared to someone else that consumes the same bolus of carbohydrate. So with respect to a bolus of carbohydrate administered into two people, let's say theoretically they're absolute phenotypically and genotypically identical people with the same history, they've lived the same life, you've just cloned someone and you've had them eat one person being a carbohydrate dominant diet, the other person being a fat dominant diet, have them have a bolus of carbohydrates, there will be a response like that, okay? This is not pathological, this is an idea idea to represent mechanisms that are occurring within the body when someone abstains from the consumption of carbohydrates. Physiological insulin resistance has been covered. We're done. And let's say you're correct. Maybe, perhaps this is causing this elevation in blood glucose and insulin. So, if that's the case, then there is no problem. They're not consuming glucose. When you depend on gluconeogenesis, your body creates the exact required amount of glucose as is indicated at that given instance in time. So there is no reason to believe that the glucose level then in their blood is a problem in the subsequent insulin because those are always going to be working in tandem. They're going to be working in synchronicity and lockstep. We're done. Known as adaptive glucose sparing. No, it? not glucose sparing. Oh, the actual technical term. It's not glucose sparing. Sparing indicates that something is being held against its concentration gradient, which is completely erroneous with respect to glucose because that indicates that something needs protection against utilization, which is not the case because the body creates all of the glucose it requires via a process called gluconeogenesis. Done. Well, technical term. And that's not necessarily harmful. We see this in pregnancy and teenagers, for example. Well, there you go. It's not harmful. Where muscles prioritize fat for fuel, sparing glucose for the brain. Nonsense. This temporary adaptation can become chronic with prolonged dietary patterns. So? Okay, we, we know that a population like the Inuit have an actual glucose sparing phenomenon, so to speak. They can't fast at all because of a gene knockout. Or really, it's not even a knockout. It's a, it's a gene expression. It's a SNP. But anyway. But physiological insulin resistance is still insulin resistance. So what? Insulin resistance isn't pathological in any manifestation whatsoever. It is an adaptive response that is indicated to actually have occur within the body given certain stimuli. Whether or not it's physiological or pathological, it's no such thing as pathological. What you are referring to with respect to the colloquially deemed pathological insulin resistance is not pathological. Neither is peripheral slash physiological insulin resistance. Nonsense. It's still the same process? Sure. Doesn't matter. The same process.
Ben Dickman actually spoke very briefly about the distinction between the two things there and basically said it's the same, essentially the same thing. So what? Ben Dickman still does not seem to understand that insulin resistance is not a pathology. He still has never spoken about the Randall cycle. He has still, from my understanding, not spoken about the downregulation of GLUT4 transporters on cell membranes as a result of consuming a carnivorous diet. I'm not denigrating and disparaging him, but what I'm saying is that it is very clear that he believes that insulin resistance is a pathology. He refers to it as such. He says things like insulin resistance is the cause of this. No, it's not. That's like saying a fever is the cause of another illness, when in reality, it is actually the virus itself or the pathogen that, or the antigen that's causing the problem. If anything, insulin resistance is a symptom. But what is more accurate is to refer to it as a physiological adaptive response to stimuli. One of those stimuli is not pathological, that being the consumption of carnivorous diet, and the other one actually is, that being the consumption of carbohydrates and fats together, particularly the, the carbohydrates part, though interview with my friend uh, Casey Ryan Ruff on Boundless Body Radio. Make sure you guys check out his podcast. It is incredible. However, there must be more to the story here because simply having physiological insulin resistance is not enough to cause these problems because I've seen people... That's what I was also thinking as well. So again, so what? We already covered this. Humming pre-diabetic and even one no, 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 no. See, this is the problem. Diabetes is a deadly condition because of chronically elevated blood glucose as a result of consuming glucose. You were once again looking at values. Normative levels of the population is what those represent, okay? Stop looking at levels and numbers and start looking at presentation. Any responsible clinician understands this, okay? It can be interesting, it can be food for thought, but if you are not consuming glucose, then your body is what is producing that glucose, which means that it is not a problem. And insulin will increase commensurate with glucose, typically. So again, we can get rid of the insulin issue by talking about the glucose issue, which we just talked about, and then we just talked about the HbA1c issue. Issue. Actually getting diabetic into a diabetic range for HbA1c as compared to and as inferred from normative levels of the population, that population being deranged heavily. A carnivore diet. That Covered all that not physiological insulin resistance. Correct. No, it isn't. But it definitely wouldn't help those levels presenting that high. But once again, those levels being that high is not necessarily a problem. It's not red blood cells getting longer lived. Uh, you actually don't know that with respect to the HbA1c part. With respect to the glucose and insulin thing, sure, yes. It's a problem. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. False. That is irresponsibility. The Hippocratic Oath tells you that if there is no pathology present, the physician is obligated to not intervene in that circumstance. Did they present with problems? Or did you just look and say that they had problems because of blood tests and the results of said tests? Because if it's the latter, which is exactly what you're doing, you are breaking the Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm. This week alone, I've told three people, and it's only Wednesday when I'm filming this, I mean, seriously, think about it this way. If they're becoming pre-diabetic, so to speak, and diabetic, is your prescription going to be to consume carbohydrates? I mean, is that what you're saying here? What are you saying here? What is your solution? Again, there shouldn't be one because there is no pathology. They now probably have pre-diabetes from the carnivore diet. As inferred from a blood test that is representative of the normative levels of the population, that population being heavily deranged once again. Okay, Diabetes as a deadly situation and as an actual pathology is the result of carbohydrate consumption. So really diabetes itself, you could say, isn't the pathology. The pathology is the consumption of carbohydrates, the consumption of poison, toxins. Okay, we're done here. That is the pathology. I mean, even once again, diabetes itself is an adaptive response to the thing that you're doing to the body, which is the pathology. These people don't even understand what pathology even is. Now, again, you can argue that the HbA1c is unreliable. Yet it is. True, but other markers like fasting insulin are going up, fasting glucose are going up. Covered that, didn't we? Urate is going up. Very so what? Urate is not a problem. It is not the cause of gout. Urate is a powerful intracellular antioxidant, okay? It is associated with inflammatory conditions because it is an antioxidant. ALT and GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase, these are all liver enzymes. ALT and AST are responsible for being involved in amino acid metabolism. They can be released from damaged hepatocytes, liver cells. They are not necessarily, though. When someone is consuming a carnivore diet, they're consuming far more protein than the average person. Protein is broken down into individual amino acids, which imposes more of a demand for ALT and AST creation for amino acid metabolism via transaminase reactions. That's biochemistry, okay? We talked about fasting glucose. We talked about HbA1c. We talked about urate now. We talked about ALT and GGT. We talked about fasting insulin. Ferritin. What's the problem with ferritin? 
ferritin is a storage form of iron. The only time ferritin is a real problem is when it is extremely high. And if you don't have something like hemochromatosis, which you would have been diagnosed with as an infant, you do not have a problem with your ferritin or problems with your iron levels. Unless you have one of the manifestations of anemia that paradoxically lead to high ferritin levels, you're fine. These are once again markers. These are levels, sir. Where is the pathology? Where is the evidence of pathology here? The breaking of the Hippocratic Oath is what we are seeing here. It's going up. Liver functions are going off. All markers of... What do you mean going off? Did you mean going down? Because if that's the case, no, you don't have any evidence of that. Look at creatinine, perhaps. Like dysfunction. Markers of metabolic dysfunction. There is not metabolic dysfunction occurring. Or at least you've not presented it here today. You've presented markers, okay? They're not exhibiting any pathology. Are they consuming carbohydrates? Once again, if all these people are 100% carnivore, they're not consuming carbohydrates, they have normal bowel function, they're not presenting with any problems to speak of, you are being irresponsible by telling them that there is a problem, as inferred from blood markers. Nonsense, sir. Ridiculous. Once again, any responsible clinician would understand this. Speaking of liver issues, also seems to be a particular problem. I've seen As inferred by what? Do they actually have liver problems, sir? Again, around maybe the six to nine month mark in deranged, they're having deranged liver function tests. So once again, blood tests. <laughs> ALT and AST. Yes, the enzymes involved in transaminase reactions within amino acid metabolism in the body. So what? With weight loss, that is true. But I've seen plenty of people having things like gamma GT rise. Okay, we're done. I'm done with this. I can't do this anymore. So we basically have gotten the gist of this. This is a person who has decided that a blood test or multiple blood tests are going to be what determines whether someone is exhibiting pathology or not, which is not the case. Sorry, that is not the case. He has not actually said that these people have presented with symptoms. He talked about people having palate fatigue because of them operating under a false notion that for some reason you have to eat the same food prepared the exact same way on carnivore, which you don't have to. You also don't have to be 100% carnivore if you don't want to be. Fine. Okay, that's another false notion. <laughs> You do not need to fear the carnivore diet. You do not need to think that you need to eat the same food and the same meal every day, prepared the exact same way. You do not need to fear blood glucose levels, your fasting insulin. You don't need to fear insulin resistance, though. You don't need to fear HbA1c. You don't need to fear ferritin. I talked about all that stuff in my book as well, actually. The HbA1c is a conditional measurement. If anything, it's really unreliable. Blood glucose is more reliable. Same thing with insulin. But even then, context matters. Pathology at hand with respect to things like diabetes is carbohydrate consumption nothing else. So until these people start exhibiting symptoms, then blood tests can go f themselves. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, and please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And also, once again, subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to all the things I alluded to in the beginning. And also buy my book, Contraindicated, once again. And also, the link on the screen. What is that link? Well, that is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent 10% discount and a permanent free shipping discount when signing up for monthly deliveries. And if you email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com, you can find out how to receive those products for free. If you to learn more about those products, which I recommend everyone do before buying anything, I would refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products link, which is a complete video elucidation and explanation of what those products are, who should take them, why you should take them, and when to take them, etc, etc. And I would also further migrate to the description below to find a video between myself and Professor Bart K elucidating these products in further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself. Also, if you are someone that wants to donate one-time donations instead of having recurring payments to either Patreon or Cerule, I have now made available two donation platforms, that being a donation link for PayPal, and also GoFundMe, which are both linked in the description below. And also, once again, email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com if you have any questions whatsoever. So, with that being said, join me next time when someone else decides to break the Hippocratic Oath, no matter their intentions, and, well, yeah. See you then.